Elina ma noa i ka lehu aloha, aloha ua tu ai hine. Mai lua hine a i wai ki i ki, ki a i ke ka hau kani. Kani no na leo, e o kama aina, aina aloha e ma noa e. Welcome everyone to the East West Center and to um, Burns Hall. And uh, I have the honor and pleasure of introducing Sean Mallon. Um, <clears throat> we're gathered here uh, because it's the start. It's actually the very first week of our weaving a ne network of care. Um, Weaving a Network of Care for Oceanic Collections. And it's a Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Museum Institute. And um, we have people here gathered from 13 island communities all throughout Moana Nui Akea. And this institute has allowed us the opportunity to bring in several uh, prominent international scholars, and instructors for our program. And one of these people here is Sean Mallon. He's a senior curator of Pacific culture and history at the National Museum of New Zealand, Te Papa um, You know, on, on, on the one hand, there are introductions that give people's degrees. They talk about where they went to school, they talk about the books they've written, the programs that they've run, the exhibitions that they've curated. But for purposes of tonight, what I really just want to acknowledge instead is the nature of, of our relationship over the years in terms of how, as somebody who was working at Bishop Museum for a really long time, what I learned from him as a curator at Te Papa was that we're not bound by our histories. That it is, it is as equally important what the nature of our relationship is today between our communities and those that are held within museums. That the golden standard of being freely gifted like Kalanyo Pu'u's cloak that was freely gifted to cook, that we're not bound by that history. And instead, what matters more is how important those mea vai vai ali'i were to Kanaka Maui of today. And so um, for me, it is an immense, um, in immense gratitude and honor um, that we're able to bring him here today, that he can once again return to Hawaii, be in the presence of that which he saw once all the time uh, in Wellington that has now returned home um, due large, in, in large part to um, how the way curators move behind the scenes. And um, uh, we just have so much to learn from you, and I'm just really grateful again that you've come and journeyed this far to be with us today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Noah. <laughs> Aloha, Aloha Kako. Um, half a day, Bulavanaka, uh, Talofalava, Talohani. 
Kia rana, i rana. Whakalofa lahi atu, Māori, kia ora. And um, as they say in New Zealand these days, warm Pacific greetings. Um, really, really grateful to be here and I'm very um, grateful too for your introduction. And uh, just, um, you know, I'm just uh, really inspired by, by by the people in this room and the in the moment here um, that we're sort of sharing. So it's it's great to be back in Hawaii after a couple of tough years that we've all sort of shared experiencing COVID and um, being separated from um, our family and friends. And it, it, it's so good to be in this space. And yeah, I'm here to talk to you about some old white guy too. <laughs> and I, I hope that would hook a few people in and the politics of cultural authority. And that, that's sort of why I'm here is to, um, is to share some of my experiences with um, the cohort, but also to learn as well. And I've already learned a lot in my conversation with Bishop Museum over the last three this afternoon. Just um, so invigorating to be around people sharing similar experiences, but also different ones and faced by similar challenges. And it's a constant, it's a reminder that we are constantly trying to do better work and, and figure out and navigate a path forward in our profession. Now the talk I'm going to do today is um, a revisiting of, a, of another talk I did. And I'll, I think I'll probably get through it in about 40 minutes, so um, please be with me, checking the time. In 2018, I was invited to give the Raymond Firth, um, excuse me while I get used to tabbing and commanding. Yes, okay. In 2018, I was invited to give the Raymond Firth lecture at the European Society for Oceanius Conference held in Cambridge in England. I titled it Some Old White Guy Too, Museums and the Cultural Politics of Authority. And this title was not a reference to the late Fessor Raymond Firth, who is a fellow New Zealander and a leading anthropologist of the region. I would never refer to one of the most respected figures in the field as some old white guy, although he did actually live to the age of 100. I'll return to the some old white guy I'm referring to at the end of this talk. But the, the work of Sir Raymond Firth that I'm most familiar with was his singled authored work, We the Tikapia, published in 1936, although he also wrote on aspects of Malay, Māori and Polynesian economy. In preparation for the lecture, and while looking at aspects of Firth's work and life, I came across a short address he wrote in 2001. It was delivered on the occasion of his 100th birthday, 25th of March 2001, that was celebrated by the Association of Social Anthropologists of the Commonwealth, of which he was life president for 25 years. The celebration took the form of a luncheon in the penthouse of New Zealand House in London, where he was also presented with the Naya Thakalawa Medal on behalf of the New Zealand-based Polynesian Society. The medal was named after Dr. Rusiate Naya Thakalao from Fiji, one of the first doctoral students who had gone on to teach anthropology and play a leading role in reshaping the Fiji administration. On this occasion, Sir Raymond titled his address The Creative Contribution of Indigenous People to the Ethnography. This was a topic that he said was, quote, if not ignored by historians of anthropology, does not, if not ignored by historians of social anthropology, does not emerge very clearly in their work, end of quote. He said, quote, a common concept of, that of social anthropology was of alien, usually Western field workers extracting information from relatively passive informants and interpreting it in light of their own way of thinking. Firth goes on to discuss how while the ultimate inspiration for social anthropology came from the West, the relationship of indigenous people to this inspiration has had different components and forms of involvement, from the contributions of elders and indigenous cultural experts to ordinary informants, to indigenous people trained as professional anthropologists and teachers of the subject. 
He argued that ethnography and social anthropology have been the creation of both Western, uh, alien Western and indigenous contributors. And he drew attention to what we might refer to today as indigenous people's agency in the ethnographic works created with and about them. In my lecture, I continued Firth's thread of conversation from 2001, and I wish to, to do the same here tonight, shifting a little bit from my talk in 2000, 2018 to reflect specifically on the, my experience as a curator working at the Museum of New Zealand Te Papa Tongarewa. So it's a bit of a backstory, it's a bit of a behind the scenes, um, perhaps a little bit of a fly in the wall revelation of, of what life has been like as a curator at the museum. As Firth argued for ethnography and social anthropology, museology in Te Papa, where I work, has been the creation of both West, alien Western and indigenous contributors. However, today more than ever, the questions about indigenous people's representation in museums and who has narratives around them is unprecedented. We can frame what is going on in terms of the politics of authority, how it is established work and how it is shared. This is one aspect of our work as curators of Pacific collections where we can always do better. This is the old museum that I, I started there in 1992. And um, this is the museum where we work now on the waterfront of Wellington. I entered the museum through an internship program aimed at training Māori and Pacific Islands people for the new museum that opened in 1998. My co-trainee was Fuli Malo Pereira, who was based at the Auckland Museum. And I think it is significant that we were both students with anthropology and that we were fortunate to be mentored by Dr. Janet Davidson, an accomplished archaeologist and scholar of Aotearoa New Zealand and the wider Pacific region. For myself, anthropology provided me with a range of investigative and analytical tools that subjected me to certain expectations from our colleagues and communities. The negative stereotypes associated with anthropologists, anthropology, museums in general, and curators created a colonial hangover that accompanied our professional roles in the setting up of this new post-colonial museum. However, it is not only the stereotypes of our academic disciplines but perceptions of our educational training and ethnic backgrounds that shaped our curatorial roles in a range of ways. At various times it brought our insider-outsider status into relief and influenced the nature of our engagement with the peoples we were employed to represent. As an ethnographic field site, Te Papa is illuminating for its institutional structuring of authority in relation to the individuals and communities that engages in its work. Te Papa's hiring of Māori and Pacific people at the time could be seen as a progressive move towards diversifying the staff at the museum and an orientation toward dealing with cultural authority and who was talking for whom. Since the opening of Te Papa in 1998, the cultural influence of Indigenous Māori in shaping and decolonising museology within Te Papa and Aotearoa has been groundbreaking. Guiding a great deal of our curatorial work is mana tonga, the concept of mana tonga, the power and authority associated with tonga or cultural activity, access, collaboration, and sharing authority with older communities. Although mana tonga is grounded and expressed through Maori culture and language, it is a concept that applies to all the communities that Te Papa represents and interacts with, regardless of their origins in the Pacific. Asia, Asia, Europe, or elsewhere. Put into practice through exhibition, event, and publication development, it is an important concept for guiding all kinds of collaborative activity, including collection development. Mana Tonga is a catalyst for discourse and debates that have transformed our curatorial work over the last few decades. As Pacific Island curators, we have been relied upon to provide accurate and authoritative information to Te Papa on a range of Pacific Islands. In my career in the 1990s, this was fascinating. 
I was in my early 20s then and I was certainly not ready to answer every question on the Pacific put to me by senior executives and creatives in Te Papa. Despite my freshly waxed, sealed, imprinted university degree, despite growing up as a Pacific person and working in the museum setting among vast cultural collections, I quickly discovered how much I didn't know about the Pacific. The late artist and curator Jim Viviere, who is of Cook Islands ancestry, memorably described contemporary Pacific art in New Zealand as being like a three-legged race. It is both a novelty and a handicap event. He said, the artist is tied to his community on one side and his audience on the other. Uncomfortable about working alone in the Western tradition of individual statement and at the same time constricted by the art world itself, which, only off, which offers only a narrow opening, a vision of an imagined Pacific Island world through which the through which her work is admitted to a public space. Viviere's analysis also applies to the role of a curator of Pacific Islands descent. We are similarly tied to our ethnic communities on one side and on the other the expectations of our employers and of our anthropological and curatorial disciplines. Like some contemporary Pacific artists, we are uncomfortable working alone or with the idea of individual statement and at the same time we are boxed in by the negative stereotypes of our professions, such as the all-knowing curator, the connoisseur, the ethnographer, the anthropologist. We are perceived as controllers, but we are also controlled in how we navigate the tensions and the, and the agents of the creative and intellectual communities that we work with. For anthropology scholar Tim Ingold, the stereotype of the anthropologist as ethnographer is particularly problematic. Because as he reflects, it, quote, holds anthropology hostage to the popular stereotype of the ethnographer, which is not without foundation, is one who is bound to the retrospective calling of lives that are always on the brink of disappearing. End of quote. Now, our curatorial practice is hardly bound to the retrospective chronicling of lives. Although we deploy ethnographic methods in our work, the role of, Pacific cultures, the, role of the Pacific cultures curator like the anthropologist is in constant change. It is always just short of formation as we live alongside and within our communities who like us are also in what Engold might describe as a constant state of becoming. On the current curatorial staff, on the current curatorial staff of Pacific Descent, we represent the disciplines of anthropology, Pacific studies, art history and history, while acknowledging that none of them, like curating, are homogenous in practice. They are cut through by hierarchies, different schools of thought and research interests. As individuals, we bring to Te Papa our own intellectual genealogies and deploy their philosophies and methods in the workplace as we feel appropriate. In the academic sense, we are all at different points in our learning and careers, and in the cultural sense, we possess different levels of experience, fluency and knowledge. Again, we are developing as curators, we are becoming. As well as representing Pacific people through the museum, we are representing Pacific people within the museum. There are only a few of us on staff in Te Papa, and how we go about our work creates an impression amongst our colleagues about Pacific peoples in general how we interact and behave, our capabilities, strengths and weaknesses. At the time of like, thinking through these ideas in the curatorial and collections areas, that is Pacific cultures and art departments, we represent our individual ethnicities, Tongan, Tahitian and Māori, Samoan and English, Samoan and Irish, Cook Islands and Welsh. We range in age from the early 20s to 60 plus and we bring our varying life experiences to our work. We are hardly representative of the Pacific population, but we represent Pacific peoples nonetheless. Like our ethnic Pacific communities, our colleagues in Te Papa and the wider museum sector are our most frequent collaborators, and only just two professional communities we interact with regularly. Our good relationships with them depend on our leadership and guidance on Pacific cultural issues. They also depend on our recognition of the many skills that they have as non-Indigenous people and that they bring to our shared work representing Pacific peoples at Te Papa. 
Over the years as Pacific Cultural Cultures team members, we've had to be alert to our biases and our own ethnocentricities. But more often than not, we share a sense of solidarity in our work. This is shaped by our investment in organisational values like Manatonga, but also conditioned by our small numbers and the need to work cooperatively to access limited resources and opportunities. We've seen other larger curatorial teams in terms of numbers struggle at times to balance a shared team vision with individual goals and perspectives. Now the right to represent Pacific peoples is contested within and outside the museum, among us as curators and among artists and other cultural producers. In 2021, some of you may remember that, that Tahitians were here, Wheela and Mare, um, Mare Kura Whakataka Brightwell questioned what they saw as other Pacific people's entitlement to Tahitian narratives relating, relating to the legacy of the 19th century French painter Paul Gauguin and the works he created in Tahiti. They criticised prominent Samoan contemporary artists for their involvement in the exhibition, Paul Gauguin, Why Are You Angry?, developed by the Nye Carlsberg Glyptotech in Denmark in November 2020 to August 2021. They claimed that the museum's commissioning of critical responses to Gauguin's works that in the commissioning of critical responses to Gauguin's works, they chose to omit Tahitian voices favouring artists of Pacifica, in brackets, Samoan descent. At Te Papa, my colleagues and I have also found that being of Pacific descent doesn't give us unqualified access and trust from the diverse communities that we deal with. We have the growing discomfort amongst ourselves when, about when it is appropriate to speak or publish on specific cultural areas, gender or topics outside those that we are personally or directly affiliated with. Sorry, I'm a bit slow with this um, technology. One of my significant research projects in recent years was on Samoan tattooing. It produced a I think I've lost the cursor here. Can I get a the left? Right. right. Left. Oh yeah. Let's see it now. One of my most significant projects was on Samoan tattooing. It produced a publication including sh short essay or interview contributions from 17 other tattooed and non-tattooed Samoans. It was collaborative in nature, but only went so far. I'd never attempt a similar project on tattooing related to another island group without co-authoring or co-designing a significant collaborative component. But the changing politics around writing and representing others in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and Te Papa might make this impossible in the future. Another curator might get away with the sole authored approach overseas in another institution where they are further away from indigenous communities, but it would not save them from questions of possibly criticism in the contemporary social and digital mediascape we operate in. As soon as something is published, you open up a correspondence with the world and you are accountable. In the 1990s, I was collaborating with a small collective of experienced artists and curators on a photography exhibition project. And as I was new to working in museums, as in my early 20s, I tried to be respectful towards them and referred to them collectively as experts about the subject matter we were dealing with. Oh no, 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 Sean, they said, we are not experts, we are learners. Now I think this may have been false modesty, but I like to think of it as a small moment and a generous gesture that allowed me to enter into the conversation about our work on a more equal footing. It's a learning from the curatorial field that shaped my practice. For several years now, my closest colleagues and I have actively resisted calling ourselves experts, choosing instead to refer to ourselves as learners. And for us, it is not false modesty. We know we possess some knowledge, some may even call it expertise, but rather it's an orientation we wish to maintain, a willingness to be open and receptive to others and their knowledge. In a museum like Te Papa, where we are at such close physical, cultural and digital proximity to our communities, is difficult, and in our case not culturally desirable, to be a curator of the ivory tower variety, the all-knowing connoisseur. You never know who you are talking to. 
Often the experts in our communities do not have business cards or name tags identifying themselves. You may never know when the person you are talking to is a chief, a taxi driver, but also a recognised historian, composer or poet in their community, not to mention an experienced canoe builder, shark fisherman or weaver. An expert vision of the curatorial role is possible for us, maybe even necessary in other institutions with ethnographic collections where distances from source communities are greater and levels of engage engagement less frequent. However, this is not to say that the persona of expert curator does not have cultural capital at home in Te Papa. Often people desire, people from our own communities desire to speak to someone who they consider to be an expert, someone who can provide them with quality information or advice or bring their skills and training to bear on a project or query. I agree with other scholars who have argued that there is a place for expert knowledge of collection and quote, expertise to negotiate the challenges they raise, ranging from complexities of provenance to ethical questions of access and interpretation. To totally disavow ourselves of expertise is to risk oversimplifying the complexities of voice, accountability and power in the representation of culture. That's from Onical. Despite the organisational and structural mechanisms to help share and manage authority with our communities, there are other ways in which we struggle with curatorial authority on a day-to-day -day basis. Some of them relate to our age. One of my friends of Samoan and Māori descent who works in a Māori policy unit in the New Zealand government department said to me, we only become adults when there's no one older than us. And he was referring to the appropriateness of talking about cultural issues in certain Māori contexts when you are of a specific age or the appropriate age. It's a papa colleague who is Māori told me she is referred to as a baby when she's on, when she's on a marae, even though she's a, in a senior leadership position in Te Papa and in her early 40s. When it comes to cultural authority, age matters. Our age matters outside our Pacific communities, outside our Pacific communities, outside of communities too, within the professional sphere. In 2014, I was attending an advisory group meeting at one of the most prestigious art museums in London when one of their lead curators introduced himself to me and said, so how long have you been working in museums? And I said, over 20 years. He looks at me and says, what, did you start when you were fucking 12? <laughs> now, perhaps I looked young to this curator, but maybe his question was more about what I was doing attending a meeting of scholars at a prestigious institution, looking the way I did. I might as well have been on a marae, or maybe I should have worn a suit that day. In 2010, on the other side of the world, I was attending the museum symposium in Taiwan, when after delivering my paper, someone approached me and said, aren't you a little young to be a curator? I was 42 years old at the time. <laughs> ages, of, ages of course connected with leadership and responsibility, as well as participation in cultural life and the accumulation of life experiences. Of course, you also need a little bit of self-belief and ego to be a leader, to push ideas forward and get things done. We often remind each other about how if you find yourself as the only Pacific person at the table, you have to represent our collective interests, regardless of your age. <clears throat> in an environment and industry where, where we are underrepresented, we can't risk not having a voice. In relation to this issue, I circulated an article to a couple of curators and to Papa and externally about the success of New Zealand music promoter Mark Kneebone. In the interview, he talks about how at the beginning of his career, he is becoming used to being the youngest guy in the room. One day, the chief executive of the international business group he was involved in eventually told Kneebone it was time to talk up. He said, you're in here in the room, you are here in the room for a reason. You've got to contribute. You all get that you are young, but you are here for a reason. Pipe up or else get out of the way for someone else. The bluntness of that message hit home to me the other people I sent the article to. If we find ourselves the only Pacific or maybe young person in the room, we feel a lot of pressure to perform. It's not easy to pipe up, and there is risk that if we leave or get pushed out of the way, someone may not replace us. The politics around who is culturally able to do the work of curators has a significant influence on our Pacific curatorial roles. Despite being curators of Tongan, Samoan and Cook Islands descent, sometimes we are not worthy in the eyes of our community to be curators. It may be because culturally we are considered too young to be talking about history and valuable cultural treasures. We are the wrong gender, 
too intellectual, unskilled, or unknowledgeable in cultural matters such as specific languages and customs. We may be of Pacific descent, but maybe not the appropriate cultural group. While we have studied and worked hard to acquire qualifications to find roles in the museum, there are people in our own community who want to discredit our point of view or knowledge and undermine any authority we may have. There's a sense that as, an indigen as Indigenous people, as natives, we are inauthentic because of our Western education and our professional position. It's a case of Pacific scholars slash curators being the inauthentic natives versus the authentic natives, such as the fisherman, the weaver, the artist, or the working class Pacific Islander. This is observable in museums and in the academy too, in universities, where sometimes your education can be a source of professional, personal and family pride, but it can also distance you from your community. Like Pacific Cultures curators, my Tauranga Māori curators at Te Papa are subject to similar circumstances, but with added complications. Likewise, their authority or cultural authenticity can be contested by parties inside and outside the museum. Māori staff are significant in numbers throughout Te Papa and diverse in their age, experience and iwi and hapu affiliations. While Māori curators may have the curatorial job title and responsibility to respond to the research demands of their various communities of interest, they also have to negotiate the cultural and political hierarchy amongst Māori staff within Te Papa. It can be difficult for Māori curators to make the curatorial cultural call when it could be overridden by a multitude of people throughout the museum. It may be someone older, someone, someone with stronger iwi or tribal affiliations, cultural knowledge, or even just an interest in the issue at hand. In the preparation for my 2018 Raymond Firth lecture, my colleague Pua Waikian shared with me an insight that, quote, the intrusion of colonisation has meant that sometimes Māori judge each other on overall capability by the measure of your ability to stand and mihi, or speak, to be fluent, know all the songs, etc. To be a leader of Māori sometimes means you have to prove you haven't been or have withstood colonial corruption. In addition, Puai says it doesn't help being female either because some Māori men with their Western influence preferences insist that, insist that men lead and women support. This is a significant obstacle to her work. As Pacific, culture, as Pacific cultures creators, this is something we too struggle with inside and outside the museum in varying degrees. Amongst ourselves, there are a host of situations we contest, where we contest what is culturally appropriate and what is not, who gets to participate and who doesn't. Externally, we convene and seek advice from Pacific advisory groups and other informal community networks, but they too have their politics. Inside Te Papa, some of our authority is due to the autonomy that being Pacific peoples, a minority in the museum, affords us. Unlike Māori, we don't have the same internal cultural hierarchy surrounding and influencing our work. Unlike larger departments such as art, history or the sciences, we have a smaller group of non-specialists at Te Papa who feel comfortable intervening in our work if they have to. This is one situation where our exoticness and our non-Pacific colleagues' lack of cultural fluency allows us to self-determine what we do. But this doesn't mean we are isolated from risk. There are occupational challenges, or should I say hazards, relating to our authority and cultural competency in the curatorial role. In many professional environments, workers will be aware of workplace bullying. However, one should witness will be the victim of what I would call cultural occasion bullying. For example, we'll be organising or participating in a cultural event, and someone you may not even know who they are, will take it upon themselves and make it their job. Actually, it may even be their job to put you in your place, to make you and everyone else know that what you don't know, that you don't know what you're doing and that they do. In the heightened environment of a cultural event or similar case, people use mistakes or deviations from established practices to demonstrate their own cultural competency and exercise their power. They do, do this not only to ensure smooth running and success of the event, but also perhaps to enhance their own status as leaders or culturally informed people. 
or to undermine those qualities in others. Any indiscretions or, or errors related to cultural competency can be addressed privately, but they're often remarked upon publicly during or after an event. A critic's demonstration of their cultural authority can be a very performative act, and I know this firsthand. I was on duty at a high-profile Samoan event at Te Papa and dressed in appropriate attire, trying to look like the best Samoan curator I could be. I had my EFI tanga on, my ulafala, my nice white iron shirt. When an Arata chief running the event, rather than send someone over to get me or pass along a whispered message as I was standing a few metres away, decided in front of a crowd of a couple of hundred silent people to stand up and yell out, Sean Mellon! Sean Mellon! to get my attention and send me scurrying over to him like the unchiefly titled someone I am. Apparently he needed to speak to me immediately. As I scurried to him, I quietly thought to myself, this is hilarious, but also very, very unnecessary. However, in hindsight, I also realized that he was actually doing his job as a Samoan chief and our turn as a prominent cultural leader. He was demonstrating his control over the proceedings and his authority over the museum space and me as a younger, untitled Samoan. There was no sharing of authority required in this situation. His decentering of our authority as curators was entirely appropriate. Our cultural knowledge didn't matter, with the exception of culturally knowing our place. One of the ways our agency, though, however, is evident in the museum is in how we braid the values and customs of Pacific peoples into our curatorial practices. It is manifest in how we work with and against the structure of the museum to achieve positive outcomes for Pacific peoples. This is not to say the museum is against us, but rather that, that its colonial origins, as well as contemporary factors such as social class, gender, ethnicity, and cultural awareness, influence the politics within the museum, and therefore our representation and access to resources and opportunities. My former Te Papa Mataranga Māori colleague, Matariki Williams, has argued that bringing tikanga Māori, Māori customs and values, into the museum is not about decolonizing. Quote, it is indigenizing, Māori-fying, she says. She argues it's about surrounding Taonga and museums with their people, language and cultural practices. She says to speak of decolonizing is to speak of something completely different, as it requires a comprehensive disestablishment of a structure that is not of or by Māori, end of quote. I share these concerns with Matariki about the limits of decolonizing the museum, and like her, I see better prospects for indigenizing the museum while recognizing that what indigenization means is highly politicized and its definition is contextual and in constant negotiation. It may occur in a range of ways for different groups interacting or represented by the museum. Our agency as curators is also th is threaded through our approaches to our core work of exhibiting, collecting and cataloging. This is in how we write exhibition labels, develop co-collecting projects, rework the catalogue and share its interpretation. Outside these core, core curatorial activities, we indigenize our practices and how we collectively work for our communities, communities when they visit Te Papa and manage relationships between ourselves as Pacific colleagues, but also with our Māori and non-Māori colleagues. Internally, we have quietly established relationships and ways of working that sit beneath or at least, or at least intermeet Te Papa's organizational structure. They don't appear on any organizational time uh, line diagram or plan, but we have a long history um, we have a long history of meeting informally across teams to advance our collective interests, to advocate for and share opportunities for our people to volunteer and experience working with collections, to support our colleagues' events and projects. We have pulled our strategic thinking and problem solving skills and applied them to work across our work areas. We have what James C. Scott would describe as our public transcripts, those that everybody sees, and the hidden transcripts, those behind the scenes. With the hidden transcripts expressed in practices that aim at an unobtrusive renegotiation of power relations within the museum. Scott also refers to infrapolitics, which is, quote, the realm of informal leadership and non-elites, of conversation and oral discourse, and of surreptitious resistance. The logic of infrapolitics is to leave few traces in the wake of its passage. He talks about it as the elementary, in the sense of foundational form of politics, as the building block for more elaborate institutionalized political action that cannot exist without it. In 2020 and in the wake of several restructures, 
the Pacific team gather more formally and regularly as a group of Pacific staff to, to support each other in much the same way as we have in the past. The meeting includes no curatorial staff, although there are notable absences of staff who work shifts or are, who are unable to schedule meetings because of their front of house duties. Regrettably, this creates a hierarchy of engagement between us, which effectively excludes them from some of the collective discussions that inform our work for Pacific people at Tapapa. One described this as exclusion from the quote, thinking life of museums. However, there are other absences among the Pacific team that I suspect reflect ambivalence about our gatherings. They are staff who aren't invested in a Pacific collective, can't prioritise it, or see, or see it being outside their professional role. For similar reasons, there are some non-Pacific colleagues who work against our efforts to build solidarity and are reluctant to release staff to participate in meetings. They too appear to see the cultural networking as peripheral to their staff's core role in the museum. However, it is also their responsibility to reprioritise their team work plans, not the pan-organisational needs of Pacific staff. Despite these circumstances, we continue to share our cultural and institutional knowledge, our professional networks, our energy, and our labour. Our group has representatives from different tiers and ethnicities with vastly different levels of experience. Amongst ourselves, we try and recognise people's skills in, way that, in ways that coexist, but also cross-cut cross -cut the official organisational structure. One of our older and most experienced team members, Grace Huttons, Grace Hutton is of Cook Islands and Welsh descent, and in recent years she has transitioned from Grace Hutton, the Pacific Cultures Collections Manager, to Mama Grace as we would call respected women elders in the Cook Island community. Nina curator, my colleague curator Nina Tonga, began using the title Mama Grace as a mark of respect in 2015 when she worked with her on a joint project. Grace initially tried to resist it, but over time she has gradually and humbly accepted the recognition of Pacific, of the Pacific team and the wider Te Papa staff. While we use the the title Mama Grace at Te Papa for a few years, whose status as a leader in the wider community was officially acknowledged in 2021 when she was awarded a Queen's Service Medal in the New, Ze New Zealand New Year's Honours. These honours, like other accolades individuals receive outside the museum, enhance not only the mana of the individual, their family and ethnic group, but also that of our museum, our institutions. Our agency is not, just, is not just in how we manage our relationships with each other, it's in how we create spaces that mediate social relations between ourselves and the communities we represent. When I reflect on our many tours and interactions in the Pacific Cultures Collection Storeroom, I think of how we've curated our own Pacific space. We transformed a room that was photographed and described by one contemporary artist as a vault into a room of participation and observation one that mediated a traffic and knowledge exchange with a range of visitors from around the world. Some of you might recognize some people in these next few slides. Mm -hmm. following, an, uh, following an argument by anthropologist Margaret Rodman, by joining multi-locality to multi-vocality, we can think of the storeroom as a Pacific space through which we can explore its connections to other Pacific places and other peoples. Rodman argues that people embody places. And for us, if this is true, then our power and agency was exercised in constructing our own space in Te Papa rather than being incarcerated or mobilized We exercise our agency in how we go about our work and in our choices about where to put our efforts, whom we engage with and how. Our communities often do the same. They exercise their agency too, and sometimes it's against us curating them. For some communities, the museum doesn't matter. Sometimes you can't even give authority away or pay people to assert it in their own interests. People can resist the museum and its curators even if we seek to share authority with them and build a relationship. Even when you establish correspondence with the community, you can still get it wrong. 
And there's always that one person who's willing to point this out to you. A story that comes to mind is from the mid-2000s when we managed to negotiate funding to host one Pacific Ethnic Community Day at Te Papere Year. There was a particular community who we tried to engage with over many years through exhibition development work, but without success. We had offered to attend their regular community meetings to present our project proposals to them, but we received no reply. We invited them to visit us. We offered to provide them with transport, even a participation fee, but no date ever seemed to suit them. We seemingly couldn't pay them to suit the authority, but in hindsight, this is exactly what they were doing. When the funds came to host their community day, we were determined to give them their turn representing themselves at Te Papa. We thought the best way to involve them was to invite them to curate the day and a schedule of events and demonstrations. We asked two men I knew in the group to undertake this work, and with the approval of their elders they set about the task. On the day of the event it was well attended and appeared well organised. There were carving displays, weaving and even fishing demonstrations. The, the elders attended in numbers. However, at one point in the day I noticed both of our collaborators lurking at the periphery of the activities and looking a bit stressed. I discovered that the communication within the community had been uneven and some key people hadn't been notified of the event or were not present. Towards the end of the day, another man I knew came up to me and said, Hey Sean, great event. How did you organise this? And he recognised one of the names. He said, ah, yes. He said, you talked to the right one. But Sean, he said, leaving closer, you should have talked to the right, right one. How we represent our peoples at Te Papa through a curatorial work is conditioned by a political environment, which since Te Papa con conception has been around the Treaty of Waitangi and the ambitions of Te Papa to be a bicultural museum. Our access to power is influenced by the power Tangata Māori have in the museum. Much of what we achieve is based on their achievements. In Te Papa's contextualisation of the Treaty of Waitangi, Pacific peoples are Tangata Tiriti, people of the treaty, people who belong to the to land who, people who belong to the land by right of the Treaty of Waitangi. I've written elsewhere about how as a member of a team representing Pacific cultures in Te Papa, the bicultural focus on the relationship between Māori and Pākehā sets in relief the importance of understanding where Pacific people stand within the National Museum. However, former Te Papa Kaihotu or Māori leader Te Taru White on more than one occasion said to me, remember Sean, Pacific peoples, Pacific Islanders' relationships with Māori predate the treaty. Te Tauri was of course referring to the ancestral homeland of Tangata Māori in the islands of Eastern Polynesia and the way Whakapapa, or Māori genealogy, records these ancient connections. Te Tauri's reference to Māori and Pacific Islanders' historical and genealogical connections was a reassurance of our place in Te Papa, but also a reminder of our responsibilities. Our power as Pacific staff in Te Papa, as Pacific curators in Te Papa, is intrinsically connected to how we support and provide allyship for the self-determination of Māori in the National Museum. Now, the project of biculturalism has its limitations, I guess, in setting a development agenda for a wider multicultural society, but in its narrow focus, and more, most importantly in the context of New Zealand museums, it does allow for the practicalities of managing relationships to be explored. It develops cultural awareness and supports conditions for Māori self-determination. However, the quest for self-determination in the museum is not, also, is not always a progressive one or one of constant growth. It demands reflection, refreshment and renewal. It is influenced by changing leadership, personalities and new and conflicting ideas and competing priorities. It will be slowed down or sped up by external interventions. As specific peoples in the National Museum, we have tended to recognise that Māori deserve the same sort of status we would expect if we were in a similar situation in our own homelands. The power of our allyship lies in supporting Māori to establish a voice and a stable platform to progress their social and cultural objectives. Then there will be foundations for the empowerment of everyone represented in the National Museum. Scholars have called the museum a field site, a contact zone, an engagement zone, one where our interactions and engagements with our colleagues, visitors and communities creates an institution in all its unevenness, its many dimensions. Like Tim Ingall's anthropology, the curatorial activities of exhibiting, collecting and cataloguing compare us to do our work. Ingall argues that moving, knowing and describing more than being in or immersion. A being moves, knows and describes must be observant. 
being observant means being alive to the world, end of quote. In contrast to this vision, he describes the 19th century stereotype of the armchair anthropologist, sitting in their libraries ensconced in comfortable chairs as they carried out their comparative work. In his conceptualization of anthropology, this cocoon of oneself, this being in the armchair, is the precise inverse of being in the world. As curators at Te Papa, the concept of mana tonga compels us to resist the comfort and solitude of that armchair. Sharing authority involves participant observation, a principal method of working for anthropologists. It's a practice that calls upon the novice anthropologists to attend, as Ingold would say, to attend to what others are doing or saying, and what is going on and around and about, to follow along where others go and do their bidding, whatever this might entail and wherever it might take you, end of quote. Like mana taonga, participant observation demands an openness, a curiosity about the world. Like the anthropologist, the curator who participates and observe, observes is a correspondent observe, observer at large. They do his or her thinking in the world. However, they also have to return to their desk, which is not as comfortable as an armchair and not a place of solitude where one can cocoon oneself. At my desk at Papa, I'm a curator, anthropologist, participant, observer, and ethnographer. An open plan office where I sit, I'm forced to do my thinking in the world because my desk and electronic devices are public access points. My correspondents communicate with me through their cell phones, through their computer screens, and call on me at, at the reception desk. Like participant observation, Manatong is not about data collection and writing up. It's about learning from the field learning from our communities, and it has transformed curatorial practice at Papa. In framing curating as a form of correspondence, we can see how the trials of exhibition making at Papa have mediated the politics of our claims to citizenships, citizenship in ways that have made the National Museum relevant and ultimately meaningful to Pacific people in Aotearoa. Through Siri, seeing curating as a form of correspondence, we can understand how museum collections are an entity that is never fully formed and how collecting, indeed curating, is not just what we do, as Tim and Gold would say, but what we undergo. It is a form of experience. However, as much as I'm invested in Manatanga and perhaps the rose-tinted notion of anthropology and curating as a form of correspondence, I'm alert to the politics and power dynamics braided throughout this process. Correspondence can be intermittent, infrequent or non-existent there are episodes of conflict and miscommunications, moments of silence and ambivalence. Authority matters, and by entering into correspondence, decentering ourselves and our relationships with the people we work with, we can recenter our institutions and in our communities. If we share authority in our work with our, collaborate, with our collaborators, it will take new trajectories of circulation and meaning. It's obvious to say this, but Tapapa is not the same institution it was when it opened 25 years ago. It does not sit still. However, this does not mean leaving behind, getting free of the legacies of colonization, as Clifford has pointed out. Like the stereotype of the armchair anthropologist or the connoisseur curator, the museum may appear to be frozen in time, landlocked by its colonial roots and history. However, museums are subject to the, poli to the politics and motivations of the society around them. In many ways, they are in a constant state sometimes an incremental state of becoming. Similarly, curators are in a state of becoming. We as specific curators are in a state of becoming. Challenges to my authority as a curator because of my ethnicity, age, cultural competency, and my qualifications suggest that I'm in the process of becoming, of not being maybe never fully formed. Didn't quite get that right, did I? When will I be a curator? When will I be old enough? culturally competent enough, educated enough. If I'm a curator in the world committed to participant observation and being an observer at large, I'll never be any of these things. Curating like correspondence is a process without end. Now, despite the good work being done at Te Papa and elsewhere, the power dynamics involved in anthropology and curating will linger on. As much as the idea of being in the world and becoming appeals, it is nonetheless difficult to dislodge the structures of power in museums. Museums and curators will remain in positions of control. Relations may be mutually, but they will somehow always be unequally beneficial. Power may be shared, but it will be distributed unevenly. The reality is someone has to take the lead, 
someone has to manage resources, and someone has to set limits. To return to my Raymond Thurth lecture in 2018, in its facetious title, Some Old White Guy Too, I was at the end of the lecture and I returned to the stereotype of the anthropologist as some old white guy. Despite our age and cultural competency, our education and experience, despite our ethnicity, despite the colour of our skin, despite being Pacific curators working for our peoples, the stereotypes associated with anthropologists and curators as authority figures, gatekeepers and controllers will die hard. I indulged, I indulged in one last personal story related to my mixed heritage. I joked how the Samoans are like the Irish of the South Pacific, and the Irish are the Samoans of the North Atlantic. Growing up in New Zealand, I've never been in a position where my Samoanness and Irishness have ever been particularly obvious, at least by my physical appearance. And this has, led, this has had implications for people's perceptions of my cultural competency and authority despite my curatorial role. I mentioned to the audience how in terms of my cultural competency I have passed on the DNA to dance a Samoan Siva or grace the stage with an Irish jig. In terms of my fieldwork, my mixed heritage hasn't given me cultural authority either, or at least it has brought it into question or made it ambiguous. This sombre reality was brought home to me when I was researching the book Tatao, A History of Samoan Tattooing, which I co-authored with Sebastian Gallio in 2017. In 2009, during the course of my research for the book, I met with Samoan tattooist Pat Morrow for the first time. My recollection is that we ended up sitting next to each other at a corner table at a symposium dinner in Auckland. He said to me, Hey, aren't you Sean Mellon? I looked at him a moment and said, Yes. Are you the one who wrote those specific art books? He said. I, said, replied, I replied, Yes, that's me. He goes, Oh, good to meet you, man. I always thought that you were some old white guy. <laughs> A few years later, in 2013, I'm sitting in a black and white 2012 Dodge Challenger sports car parked in a rose garden in Auckland, interviewing another Samoan tattooist named Steve Marching, who had actually trained Pat Morrow as an apprentice. They knew each other well. I'd never met Steve before, and at the end of the interview, I tell him the story about my meeting with Pat and how until he met me, he thought I was some old white guy. Steve takes a drag and a cigarette, leans back in his seat and says, "Ha, huh, that's really funny. I thought you were some old white guy too. <laughs> and that's where I'm at. Thank you. So we have time for Q&A. So anybody have any questions for Sean? Just a few other pics. I threw in some pics just because I realised it was a not an illustrated, friendly lecture. So I do want I, maybe I just wanted to ask. Do you have advice? I mean, there are. We have a cohort of 17 individuals from, you know, that are working in or with museums. Are you hopeful? You see a sea change that's happening? Yeah, despite some of the harsh realities, I guess, I don't know if they're harsh, but, you know, the things we have to deal with. I'm sure some of you have experienced similar things in different working environments. I am very hopeful about museums and museology, and that's why I clutch to this idea of that Tim Ingold uses to talk about anthropologists and about how, how it's a process of becoming. I really believe that and that's why I am here. That's why I can feel inspired talking to a group of people who may not have been in museums as long as me, some of you have, but because there's, there's a way in which we are constantly learning and trying to be better at what we do. And I'm um, sitting at a table with some of the um, museum stuff at the Bishop today it was invigorating, it's my passion, it's my joy. And why, if I knew everything, that wouldn't be the case. Mm -hmm. So I guess I really grooved with Tim and Gold because I liked his idea of working against the stereotype of the curator as the all-knowing, powerful one, you know? He writes the book that has everything there is to know about an island group or an African tribe. And I liked his idea that you've got to be in the world and running and alongside others 
and um, just having that curiosity and openness and wanting to share. So that might sound a little bit rosy, but that's part of what drives my interest in museums and collections. Everybody looks so serious. <laughs> I, I feel like it was a bit of a downer. Keep asking questions. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, so, as a cultural curator or civic curator, what do you think the importance of language competency is uh, as far as your curatorial, curatorial works? Should you, should you be an expert in the language that you are studying? I think it definitely helps. Um, but it's also, in my estimation, not the only index for the range of competencies you need to be a curator. Um, the ability to make um, consider judgments between this decision and that, to assess materials, cultural materials, to manage and facilitate relationships, to work collaboratively. These are all soft skills that don't exist in books. And um, language is one important index, but I think there's, there's room for other competencies that a proficient language speaker may or may not have. So I like to keep an open mind about that. But we had some really interesting conversations at the Bishop um, that opened my eyes a little bit today. I hope Bishop, people don't mind me sharing, about how the, there's different types of Hawaiian language. And I think um, someone spoke about speaking a high Hawaiian language that was rooted in, um, well, several decades ago. Yeah, I speak the language of the 1930s or something like that, the Hawaiian language, which is different than that of now. And that was a sort of a bit of an opener for me, because I've had a, a colleague at work who speaks about how her Samoan is Bible Samoan because <laughs> that's just what she grew up learning. So I think um, that was just a really nice insight too about understanding how you could be a competent speaker, but what is the kind of competency you need in speaking a language that's appropriate for the job? So, um, yeah, it's a really interesting area. Um, oh, so in our institute today, uh, we, we talked about the issue of like, resistance to sort of the work that we are doing and in museums or in cultural institutions. And uh, sometimes that resistance uh, comes in different forms. It might come from people who are uh, sort of outsiders. It might come from people who are in your own community and stuff like that. And oftentimes, of course, it's, it's you know, the work that needs to be done to be transformative is transgressive, and therefore it's, there's pushback, there's consequences. and so. For you as a curator, have you sort of encountered that type of resistance? Or I was wondering if you would uh, share some thoughts. When you talk about if I encountered resistance, are you talking about resistance to the work of the museum or myself, or is that what you mean? Yeah, well, today we talked about uh, governmental resistance, board resistance, resistance from colleagues, uh, mm -hmm. resistance from the community, so just that the work you're doing, you know, um, be Hawaiians who are against you or Chamorros who are against you or it may be people who come from outside your community who are pushing back but just uh, I think going to the even the, the the quaint antiquated image of the old white dude who's harmless and in the background and just puts together exhibits right to then sort of how uh, if you are doing radical work then you're you're making very strong political choices that have consequences and so I just wanted to hear if you if you had any experiences you know, I've talked about, and, and I wrote a blog once about how, where I mentioned um, how I used to look over the top of my desk and I'd see my colleague's, back of my colleague's chair and she used to hang a t-shirt there that said museums aren't neutral. Museums are not neutral and that was so interesting too, just, just to see how what we do uh, reflects some of the politics of, of what that we have as individuals and um, or as groups of individuals that are working in museums and sometimes our communities as well. So I think there can be various forms of activism that um, that museums can perform or help facilitate. Um, and as I've demonstrated through the talk, as I mentioned, there's, there's been people who've actively resisted us and not wanted to put, engage with the museum. And I think we have to respect that and um, just understand that when you're trying to feed your family or pay your kids educated or you've got other priorities that are more important, the museum and its cultural day 
the museum and its um, advisory group doesn't really, you know, might not rank that high in the bigger scheme of things. So it's a constant work on, and um, I think that uh, it's something we have to be aware of. We also have to resist ourselves sometimes. You know, do we work with the cultural elites, the usual go-to cultural advisors, or do we look for people outside those groups who um, have different experiences and don't have access to the kinds of forums that 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 we provide? So um, there's all, all kinds of different things like that. But it's a really good point, and I think about it often. That's why we have I talked about hidden and public transcripts because sometimes we were resisting um, resisting events in particular on within the museum itself so you know we we have our own ways of um i don't, over, I don't want to overstate it we're not we are paid to work for the museum but with it's a political place so you you're competing for different resources real estate on the floor opportunities in the program and i think all all um, my colleagues that participate or um, are motivated to do things for different reasons, you know. So, but that's what makes the museum uh, such a vibrant and um, interesting place to work too. So we have a question from Peter. Um, we have a number of people joining us on Facebook and uh, watching the live stream. On um, this question is from one of our team members, Helena Kapuni Reynolds, and it reads. Um, the learning from and becoming a curator stance you described makes me think of humility and respect as key values and practices for transforming our institutions and moving away from the sole authority model of curatorship. How have these stances and practices helped you, helped you to navigate relations where the community is in disagreement with one another regarding an exhibit or an event? It has happened. I've just got to be careful what, uh, what anecdotes I bring up on my live feed. But thank you, Helena, for that question. And it is a good one. I think um, yeah, that's where you get skills like that you develop over time in um, mediating, being a facilitator, or knowing who to go to to help broker a, a particular situation or problem. And um, it's really scary when you're 22 years old. But once you start developing networks, you figure out ways in which, um, and the people you, you can lean on, to help navigate it through. Curating can be very lonely at times, but um, you know, when you ask someone for help, uh, you're showing them respect, you're enhancing their mana as someone who could probably help you out. Um, but you've also got to be cognizant of putting them at risk as well and um, making sure you don't get them in too much trouble. So it's a, it's a, it's a good point, and uh, I can't really go into too many specific details, but we've had We've had communities fighting amongst themselves in the museum, but as curators too, we, we don't always agree on everything. So um, as long as we keep moving forward. Question? Yes? Um, thank you so much for this talk. Uh, you mentioned earlier um, challenges as a curator related to your ethnicity or your age or your like knowledge and so forth. And I wondered if you could share um, any experiences you've had or anything you've observed in others during doing this curation work related to gender. Gender, yeah. It's, um, I think sometimes we automatically fall into certain gender roles because of our um, shared Samoan ancestry. And there's some things that the guy will do or the woman will do or you know, sometimes we fall into that sort of pattern of work and it, it also relates to, um, you know, our age and seniority and what our titles may be. But we have to, sometimes we have to work against that and um, cross-cut those roles because we are a very small team. Um, I remember we had a, a volunteer once who, who we asked, um, you know, she came to work in Te Papa's collections and we, we said, we've got to take these rubbish bags out to the, out to the, the dumpster. She said, you don't have somebody to do that for you? <laughs> I was going, there's only three of us here. Let's, 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 let's take these rubbish bags. So, you know, there's, there's, there's a way you've, you've got to pitch in. And, um, and there's certain situations where issues of gender and age and ethnicity are really heightened. But these are the places where it's less public, where you, you go with the flow and do what needs to be done and, and just work collaboratively and find a solution. Um, yeah, I think that's all I can say on that one. Question. 
Thank you, Sean. I'm just updating from um, Michael's point here on resistance. And I was uh, looking at the slide on Salmon Tatao. So I was just wanting to find out uh, whether there were any resistance from the Salmon community and how it varies, or there was. What, how did you deal with it? The reason why I ask is because of the Vengia project that we do for PG, especially when it comes to you know, indigenous knowledge or sacred knowledge. Um, and sometimes we are questioned on what authority do we have to research and share this information. So I just want to hear from you about that, John. Yeah, that's a good one. And, and you know, the Tatal project was a pretty special collaboration for me. I'd been researching it for a long time. But then I met Sebastian, who'd also been researching it for a long time and had access to um, different archives and things that made his contribution valuable. And we all had a set, we had, between us we had a set of shared relationships and networks, so we just pulled that resource together to do that prop. We called it, if you notice, a history of Samoan tattooing, because to try and even write the definitive history is not possible, but that was a way of mitigating some of the politics. And um, because we were close to people, there were some things that we had to leave on the cutting room floor. There's certain things that I know about that I couldn't write about. There's certain questions I asked where the reply was, that's family business. And, um, you know, there's always going to be some things that you've got to leave out and not write about. That's okay. If I go to an archive where there's written papers, there's sometimes there's archives that you can't access. Um, you know, and as one of my friends said, I don't want to, he said to me, I don't want to see anything in archives I can't cite. So you'll always miss something. I think working with communities is the same. If you can't use it, you can't use it. Um, and it's just about relationships. So we, with the Tatao project, we tried to protect them. In terms of resistance, we had some disappointed people in the community that were upset that we didn't mention certain things or we didn't go into certain issues or answer particular questions. Um, and they were vocal about that and wrote to me. But um, as we said, it's our history. If we tried to frame it in a certain way. And that, that happens a lot with all kinds of museum work, whether you're collecting, um, writing publications, doing an exhibit. You've got to pick your frame of reference, and you, you can only tell so much. It's, we're dealing with representations, not encyclopedias of everything there is to know about tattoo. So it was heartbreaking, but it's a good discipline as well. When I think about curators, I think of the word coveting, you know, and it's, it goes back to this, you know, some old white guy in the back, and 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 so how did how did you either unlearn that trait? Maybe you never had that trait, or how you know how does one move from the idea of coveting and keeping things? to relinquishing and allowing the journey of these mea vai vai to continue on beyond the confines of your particular institution? Yeah, I think um, it's been a, 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 I don't know how to describe that journey, but I remember having the experience of going to the to Europe, European museums for the first time and actually, as a museum person, and having real difficulty getting past and even looking into storerooms, you know, and I was just so frustrated by that. And I know other people who've travelled overseas and haven't been able to see items from their own communities, and the sort of gatekeeperish, um, the gatekeeperish roles that some curators back then played, um, just really got to me big time. And I vowed I was never going to do that. To um, people if I could possibly avoid it. So um, that was a formative experience, just having that on the ground. This was in the um, late 1990s. I just couldn't believe it. Thankfully, a lot of museum people I know in Europe and the UK and the States are much more um, welcoming. But you know, that, that also probably relates to the fact that I work at Papa and that I am a museum professional. Would they allow anyone else off the street just to walk in and make an appointment? I don't know. What is a bona fide researcher? You know, there's, there's all kinds of gateways and access points that you've got to navigate. And um, so, but also, with, if we speak about the Ahuula, 
one of the things that really moved me was seeing all these Hawaiians visiting Aotearoa over many years and seeing their reactions to our collections, not just our huula. I remember one man came into the store and, and he saw the feather f uh, figure of Ku and he was a chanter. He just started crying. I said, yeah, okay. And he just said to me, I just wasn't expecting to see Ku here. And from that moment on, we've tried to be very sensitive about inviting people to do a karakia or a blessing to clear the space when they come in. But seeing that kind of reaction made me realize, man, some of these things need to go home. And um, the circumstances around the Ahuula were, were um, very compelling. Named ancestor, strong demand, entourage after entourage after entourage of people visiting um, the Ahuula, and um, the call was loud. So I don't know how, as a, just a decent human being, you can sort of ignore that and close your ears. That's, that's not the kind of practice that, um, that Te Papa encourages. It's not just Pacific team and me. I mean, we've got great leadership in the Māori. The Māori staff have been the ones that have led the charge of decolonizing and um, thinking through uh, how we manage and look after Taonga and treasures. So they're, they're, they're paving the way. You would have seen the, the, the ICOM situation recently around the wearing of feather cloaks. I mean, that's just another, another um, movement forward, I think, in decolonizing the museum. Do you want to elaborate? Because not everybody might. No. Oh, it's sort of a hard one to, I just want to get the facts straight, but um, one of Paul Aikens, who's one of our leaders here at Te Papa, uh, at Te Papa um, took on people on the ICOM Facebook page uh, where there was a debate about a celebrity wearing Marilyn Monroe's dress to a function in New York. And, um, and there was a, a debate about um, whether or not cultural treasures should be worn by stakeholder communities. So she went head to head with a couple of people on that, that, that Facebook uh, page and um, managed to get the policy of ICOM rewritten. At least that's my recollection of how it rolled out. But it was, it was a bit tense to see that unfold over a, uh, an evening or two at home. But, um, but uh, it when you see people wearing the, the, the cloaks and um, and just uh, the procedure and manner they, they bring to certain situations and the dignity to, they bring to situations um, or, or events, um, there's, there's a real sense in which the collections are, are still alive and they can be managed, you know. Um, so yeah, that's one of the most recent events that happened in the last month or so. But you can find that one online. It's more better documented than I can talk about. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I've always wanted to ask somebody in museums this question. How do you negotiate or manage relationships with communities um, for items? Uh, manage and negotiate with communities as you kind of um, work to figure out which items get displayed and for how long. How, what does that process look like to you? And how do negotiations even happen? Like, what is your approach to them? Oh, so many. I'll try and go through the bullet point style. With <laughs> collecting, um, we often brought things. Communities come and sell us things or they donate things because they want them protected. When an immense cultural treasure like the Ahuula was leaving Aotearoa, we had the Samoan head of state gift something of cultural significance to Te Papa because they wanted it preserved for future generations. So there's all kinds of different ways the museum works. Um, and the, the reasons why people donate things, they, they, they might feel burdened having them in their house. They might want them um, to be preserved for their family members in the future. But then there's people that sell things and we collect too to, re to create representative collections of different histories and different types of objects. 
Um, in terms of exhibitions, we convene advisory groups. Um, we work with people who have a connection to the particular object or taonga, and um, we try and involve them in the interpretation and the storytelling around that. But uh, every museum product is different, and um, you have a different sort of a, uh, approach to dealing with them, um, depending on the resources available and, and the time. But I'm very invested. As part of Mana Taonga, that's a key driver for us to stay connected with the, the people who have a stake in what, what, what's in the collection and, and what's going on display. Any other questions? Okay. Well, it's 7.30, so um, maybe we can wrap, uh, wrap up unless you had any final thoughts you wanted to share. All right, but I just wanted to thank you for all coming tonight and thank you for the questions. Thank you for the online people who've um, shown up and thank you, Helena, for your, your, your question too. Thank you, Noel. <laughs> because it occurred to me that I did not uh, fully acknowledge the National Endowment for the Humanities that um, has helped to, to um, bring this project to life. Um, and I want to really thank the East West Center Arts Program, the American Studies Department, the Museum Studies Graduate Certificate Program, the Public Humanities and Native Hawaiian uh, Program as well. And um, I just want to acknowledge when I said earlier that there were 13 island communities that are represented in our cohort. Um, so what we're talking about is we're talking about Lanai, Oahu, Hawaii Island, American Samoa, Palau, Marshall Islands, Wahan, Saipan, Samoa, Fiji, Kiribati, Aotearoa, and Papua New Guinea. Um, and, and it's just profound when you think about how many communities that encompasses, how many institutions, how many individuals, how many families. Um, and so I'm just really grateful for this project and this opportunity to bring everybody together. And I think we were talking earlier about this idea that sort of museums being foreign places, um, how do we indigenize, how do we decolonize, right, around all these questions. But I think, and, and this is something that that Sean's talk spoke to, which is how, how we navigate within these spaces. And I think that island people, indigenous people, are uniquely suited to be able to navigate the politics of place, the politics of people, the ability to be aware of everyone around you, their concerns, uh, being aware of of, of genealogical issues, of generational issues, of, of issues of, of place. Um, so I think, you know, in that sense too, it, it, it speaks to that hope that we can um, continue in the wayfaring of our ancestors to be able to navigate the terrain of, of, of institutions and that we will continue to do so and that we are, you know, we build upon the successes um, of those that have come before us and including those that were here tonight. So um, I continue always to learn so much um, from you. And uh, again, I'm grateful for all that you do. For um, for your community and ours. Hello. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks again. Thank you. Yes. Oh, there's food. <laughs> ample, ample food from the spot. So please, there, and it's other uh, vegetarian, I think it's vegetarian samosas. Uh, spring rolls, uh, spaghetti coconut, 
hummus, pita bread, baklava. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Okay, so I'm sorry, wait, wait, wait. don't pull it up. Stop, say it. Okay, sorry. This is a last minute edition. Yes, a last minute, very special um, offering, please. Oh, no. Oh, The glance is familiar. You want me to introduce it? Oh, okay. Um, every um, special occasion like this, we always um, wrap it up with a dance, a special dance for Sean Mellon. So it's a Samoan way of uh, um, saying thank you, mahalo, for his um, great job for us. Thank you. It's awesome. yeah. But thank you, Sari. <laughs> No, I'm going to be at the back, but he's going to go. Can you turn it off? Can you turn it Thank <laughs> you. 